Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Reacts and this is how seeing someone killed in action changed me. Well, it's on task and purpose. Yeah, at first I wasn't going to react to this because it's like a heavy topic. Uh but then I'm like, okay, wait a minute. This is like a first account, first proper account of like a soldier, uh, so, you know, infantryman actually seeing someone like that's a big deal, right? Uh I know in with this uh, media thing with the Hollywood and shit we are constantly saturated but if you sit down and think about it a second seeing someone die is like insanely heavy thing seeing an animal die is heavy thing right people uh, people see uh, uh, somehow a dog or something die on the street people are like, what the fuck you don't think about it like ah, probably I'm, i won't be I'm strong I'm, I'm a man I won't be fucked up no but when you see that it will stay with you for a long time right hell even if you see a video of someone dying or something that somebody like put it on social media or some shit but it's not social media like a messenger app or something like just spreading to people and somehow you just watching like what the fuck your days are fucked multiple days are fucked because you're thinking about that now imagine you actually being there and witnessing whether you are the one who, who does the you know like unfortunately have to do that or like witnessing that I can imagine how fucked up they'll be and even then it's like an imagination no in hell that's even close to real doesn't matter how hard i imagine the real thing must be even more fucked up because in in your mind in in back of your mind you know when you're imagining something it's not real because you're imagining it doesn't matter how hard you try to imagine it how hard you trying to make it realistic in your head it's in your head your mind realizes that right there's many things you try to really like imagine and feel it real thing will be completely different because that's actually happening is different right you can imagine a war time scenario it would be different living in a war time scenario completely different panic and all that right so yeah this 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 changes people right this changes in a lot of way so you know it could scar people uh, some people uh, might uh, you know just see the world differently might become more disciplined in things because they take life um, more seriously and like uh, you know Uh, they see every moment as important like before they might not have right people respond differently so i don't know how task and purpose basically how uh, you know he went through this but it's going to be interesting video so let's watch on this is not easy for me to talk about but i feel like i need to share this with you because i talk about war for a living but at the same time i personally know how terrible war is And for me a lot of times that's very difficult to deal with. That's a strange thing to have to confront. The fact that I find weapon systems, tactics, theory on war to be fascinating, but when it's put into practice, it's terrible and it needs to be avoided at all costs. And I think this story explains a little bit why I think that is. The first time I saw someone killed in action, I was a 19-year-old private and my unit had just gotten to Iraq. that dude had like mg42 or something like there was a machine gun okay okay look man about the guns i like guns as well i talk about guns and like how it's weird for me to even like understand how america has like guns as a second amendment and things because no other country has that it's weird to process that but i understand it right and i love guns as well sometimes people you know like hear my i guess anti gun talk like if you talk anything against gun is that really anti gun like you're just trying to talk like uh what the scenario you the way you understand it right anytime you say anything like oh, it's anti gun it's not really i love guns right i watch brandon hunter videos all the time i watch fatrison all the time right and here's my argument to that like just because you like guns doesn't mean you are you know like a like uh shooting or killing or something like that gun is a tool right even though it's made for defense its job is to basically just hurt someone sure but the you know the, there are many elements to that guns is a tool in there it's an engineering tool you appreciate the tool engineering behind it right it's like saying uh, you're a theoretical physicist great uh, you like the power of atom so you like atomic bomb you you like nuclear you like the thought of bombing cities not really it's not the same thing right no tool or a science ever killed anyone is the application of it right so you can like something uh, but you don't have to agree with how it applies right and guns are like you know okay if there were no guns there would be like stones and like knives if there were nothing there would be fist human nature is going to be human nature tools just makes it more efficient but that's about it right if you remove all the tool people will you know like fist fight each other to death or some shit
rock. We had full spectrum control of an area of operations in the town of Mushada. The town of Mushada is a sleepy rural farming community about 20 kilometers north of Baghdad in central Iraq. Anything good, bad, or ugly, it was on us. If it happened in that 15 click radius in every direction, that was our responsibility. So what that means is we did raids, foot patrols, humanitarian missions. We handed out hundreds of thousands of dollars to locals there. We did guard tower duty. Basically, any kind of security operation, we supported ourselves while we were there. Being on a combat outpost, the JSS, it can be terrible because the living conditions there are absolutely shit, man. Like, it sucked. We had showers once a week. You were able to have, like, hot food once a day. Basically the rest of the time I'm eating like meatball sandwiches from the freezer and pop tarts stuffed in my pockets. Fleas everywhere biting at you. It's 120 degrees, but I volunteered for the- Yeah, okay. My old city can't handle that shit. First of all, putting a pan down where people's dirty cargo boots are and that's where you eat. I'm not saying I'm weak enough, like I can do that, but not for long. I can't do that shit. But then again, like it's your duty. I don't know. I like to basically think that in my leisure mentality, I can't do that shit, but who knows? If I have to, maybe, but no, I don't think I don't think I can survive. My whole city can't handle this shit. I'll be constantly like inundated with like, oh, fuck me, this is all dirty and shit. Like alarms would be blaring on. I feel like I have, OCD. I don't, I'm not diagnosed with it, but I think I have OCD. It's not strong enough to diagnose it, but I think I have OCD. That's what I think. It's not strong OCD, like it's a spectrum in itself, but yeah this. I asked for it, and many soldiers have dealt with way worse than me. I mean, being on a combat outpost is, it's, as an infantryman, you want to be there because you're in the suck, but it also sucks. About 15 kilometers away from our hellhole is the giant forward operating base, Camp Taji, where there's like 4,000 troops stationed, Apache helicopter support, artillery. So our resupply came from there, and if we got in trouble, that was the closest reinforcements. The combat outpost that we're on, it's about the size of a football field around the perimeter, which breaks it up is this T-walls, which are 12 foot high concrete barriers all around the side. And there's like six guard towers on all around the perimeter. On half of it, there's about 40 to 100 American soldiers at any time. And on the other half of it is our counterparts. You got the Iraqi police and the Iraqi army and the police station that it's all built around. And we're right on main supply route Tampa. MSR Tampa runs the entirety of Iraq from the southern to northern part in Mosul. We are providing security for that route of, that, piece, that stretch of highway. Because there really isn't another good way to route supplies or armored vehicles throughout the entire country. So if an IED shut down our section, it would kind of screw up operations for the whole nation. Death had already been all around me at this point, but I hadn't seen anyone actually dead or killed. So a couple of days after I got there, an IED went off right outside the base and it took the leg off of a soldier from the 25th ID. He's about three weeks away from going home. He'd been there for 14 months. But they didn't take him to our base. They took him straight to Camp Taji at the level three care there. I'm the youngest guy in my entire company and it's starting to dawn on me the reality of the dangers here and I'm starting to really question a lot of decisions I've made in my life. Why did I drop out of college? Why did I volunteer for this deployment? Next, what happens is we found a, a hand, a severed hand, just out on a pile of rocks inside the perimeter of the base. Not sure how it got there. No one's coming and claiming that hand. We handed it into the aid station with the medics. Uh, that goes right into the burn pit. But I still hadn't seen anyone actually killed at this point yet. So these few weeks are when my unit is coming to the base and we're doing this transition phase between us and the 25th ID and we're doing what's called RIP, which is um, relieve in place. This is the most dangerous period of the tour, except for the last few weeks where the insurgents are going to test us. They're going to test our capabilities and our TTPs, they're called, or how we basically respond, our procedures, how hard we're going to go. You know, what? what is, are we aggressive? Are we more laid back? During this time, I'm getting to know the Iraqi police officers were- God, that's, I just realized that like, in the books, everything uh, seems like structural, right? You do this, you do this, great. But when you're actually in the field, there's like 40, 50 of you, and you have like a particular job. Sure, you are like a commander or something, the leader of your group, but all of you have your own, all of you are human, right? 
how aggressive you are how you respond to things is completely different than everybody else right so the way he explained like how he insurgents basically test you like you're aggressive how you respond to things man it's something right like you need to be like constantly psychologically be on top of everything psychological warfare and everything you need to have some political mind behind it like okay how to respond to this what has happened in the past what is happening now and what way i need to respond to this to send out the message that i'm not to fuck with or is that a too strong of a message might cause issues so let's should i back down too much think too much things are going on that i guess most people don't realize like what type of things so just go through you know things like this right when you really think about it when you see accounts like this is like damn this like way too much thinking is going behind it you know we're shooting the shit we're talking one of the iraqi police officers he's around my age and he's he's talking to me so he's like kind of giving me some shit he's saying you know he's married i'm married but he has kids and i didn't i didn't have kids and he's kind of making fun of me like why don't you have kids are you gay that's just we just say like the most terrible things to each other to break the ice and it's it's because it's awkward getting to know each other over there it could be a cultural thing i've seen uh india is very diverse and i've seen cultural differences where like you don't have kids what is wrong with you type of way like it might be he might be genuinely like confused like your wife you don't have kids like it might be a cultural thing who knows like there is, there is something like that right i've seen cultures where like you get married you have kids it's like automated response how dare you think anything else type of way it's it's just culture right i've seen things like that i'm not saying being gay is terrible i'm just saying back then you couldn't be in the army so we were just pushing each other's buttons then like a couple of days later what happened leading up to the attack was there's only two entrances to the outpost. One entrance for vehicles, like the strikers would come in and out of this one gate. So having only two entrances is easier to protect the base, but it also makes you more predictable. So the insurgents, our adversaries, they were looking at us and they could tell very easily they could time when we were going into the base and when we were going out. One day they basically paid a civilian, a kid I think, to bring his bike out right near the base so that no one would suspect that there was anything wrong with this bicycle. What was hidden in the basket of the bicycle was a IED, an explosive made out of engine parts, nails, screws, just packed around this explosive device. Kid? And when it exploded, it would sh send this shrapnel out at thousands of feet per second. So they waited until our patrol went out and they waited, timed it so that it would hit the Iraqis because often they were targeting the Iraqis instead of the US Army. I think because they knew that it would bring down more capabilities on them if they targeted the U.S. soldiers more. They detonated the... Yeah, the, the, of course they're not going to try to kill a soldier like that because it might intensify the pressure. You don't fuck with the USA, but they're going to like try to take out Iraqis to send a message. Like there's many psychological warfare going on. They use kid. I mean, I know they do that, but oh, fucking hell. Kid on a bicycle with IEDs. That's just like, I can't like... There are certain parts of human. Every day we live our life, we we wake up, drink our coffee, do our thing. There are certain things uh, that you know uh, we think about, like what a humanity is or how we live life, right? Everyday common people. There are some things that's just like your mind can't process. I mean, when you think about it and like really study it, like yeah, it makes sense, but it doesn't feel like the the society in the world you live in. Right, I don't, I don't have good words to think like it. It doesn't feel humane a lot of things, right? So you can't really process shit like that, right? Or just use some kid, use I, you know, put ID on him, like do this shit. Like you tell that to anyone, it's just like God damn, how the how, what? The extreme things that happen, it's just like uh, all those people, like in Afghanistan, in Iraq, all these soldiers, they constantly had this kind of a situation where there's like dilemmas. Okay, I need to take out take out this guy, who's clearly has ID and mine or whatever fuck thing that. But that that's not a guy. That's a kid. Like, what should I do? Should I like shoot the kid? Like, there must have been like a position of people where like they are actually, you know, like hesitate before even tr pulling the trigger because there's a kid there. Like this is some insane psychological warfare, man. The explosive and the shrapnel ripped through this Iraqi police officer's head. I remember feeling the whole base shake and I came running out and I saw 
two Iraqi police officers and one American soldier dragging this just deadweight body of one of this young looking Iraqi police officers back into the base. And they're trying to bring him to the aid station, the level one trauma care, which is where our medics were providing the first level of care for any casualties. I remember it was just chaos. People are shouting, yelling at each other. You're getting orders are being thrown everywhere. This Iraqi police officer falls down in front of me and he starts yelling up at the sky because his probably best friend is dead. It, it felt surreal, like it was in a play or something. I think I saw it that way because I was in shock and I'd never seen someone, the victim of violence like that. Oh, for God's sake. There are, I'm sure there have been wars like World War One and World War Two where like death becomes just like an everyday thing where it just becomes numbers, sure. But there are also scenarios where like he explained here like chaos. People are like screaming, crying, like people are hysterical. Even the people who are in command, like everybody just like... That, that becomes even more worse. If it's at least coordinated and stable... Maybe there's part of you that thinks like, okay, maybe everything's fine. Maybe, okay, there is casualties here and there, but things are under control. When everything's a chaos, when everybody's just screaming left and right, that panic scenario feels insanely surreal because in your head, like, everything's gone out of the window because there is no uh, coordination anymore. Everybody's screaming, everybody's panicking. That's a different type of scenario, right? That's just fucked up. I've seen, like, this is India, the traffic is the worst on the planet. Don't come to India and drive, I'm just telling you. Unless you want to become like a best driver on the planet. Because if you survive here, you're probably going to be the best driver on the planet. I bet I could go to US and will never have a crash. Because I'll live through India and you know drive through here every single day. But I've seen some video like some woman basically with a small hatchback just ran over a kid or something. It's just like... Uh, yeah. Th those images are haunting me in my head like I've seen that a long time ago there's like multiple videos like that I can still remember that and since then I'm like anyone who sent me video that might be problematic I'm not even gonna touch that maybe that's just me maybe that's my OCD maybe I think things too much maybe people just see things as like oh fuck me I don't wanna think about it and just move on I can't do that I have to overthink things but yeah this is just like I don't know man some things just sticks with you so it depends on who you are but yeah I guess it's just fucked up that I remember his brains were falling out of the back of his head. I felt paralyzed in fear. Your brain comes up with all these ways to cope with something that you have no point of reference for. I don't know how to process it or handle it, but there's some other guys in my unit who have been deployed before they've been they've seen this a million times and they handle it very well and they start giving directions and creating order out of this chaos that's happened unfolding they get the guy to the aid station and they start working on him trying to save his life the our medic that's in, that was in my platoon he comes out later and he says like there was never really any chance for this guy but they tried they worked on him i mean come on man his brain was hanging out how the hell are you gonna save him in that kind of an outpost it's not gonna be the world-class hospital let's be honest and even then like how are you gonna save that right oh god that's just like yeah the shrapnel like, it's not even a bullet right it's clean bullet maybe the shrapnel is more gore really oh fuck just thinking about it making me feel like what the hell it's just like it feels animalistic doesn't it like all your like what you think of a society goes out of the window when you see a, pro a human basically becomes an object like that where like the brain is hanging out and just like oh that there you go that's happened it's like process that like what the fuck why are you supposed to think with that right certain things that when you really like it's okay it makes sense sure there are accidents there are like gunshots you have a brain yeah i can see damage happening and hanging around all that but it's completely different to process it right that's just not how humans work that's not how we live right it feels very weird but he was basically dead on arrival and his brains on the ground are just laying there no one's picked them up yet but we had two dogs on our base we had roxy and rusty and they were great dogs they went on patrol with us they were 
they've been there for years one of them had taken had been shot on patrol so roxy goes up to the brains and starts lapping them up it starts eating them and sniffing them and one of the guys that i was just in shock like paralyzed uh not knowing how to handle myself i have no experience yet and this uh guy who'd been deployed before came over and he's like shoo shoo get out of here roxy that's not for you that was kind of like a running joke for the rest of the tour we would call roxy a zombie dog because roxy was eating brains and that like cracked us up we thought that was hilarious and that's to me this weird terrible feeling that i have now looking back on it that i coped with something as being i didn't know how to process that stuff but dark humor helped me feel like i guess i was in control of what was happening to some degree and it made me feel like all right one thing i've thought about this really deep like what is humor right people really don't understand this concept and they're like how the f how can you laugh at that or that you're 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 dark first of all what is humor when we see somebody fall down and we laugh are we sadistic are we enjoying that not really there is portion of our brain sees something as ridiculous i don't have any other word for it when our brain doesn't accept that like how is that normal people are not supposed to fall down so instant reaction of your brain is like oh that's not real that's ridiculous type of way and you just laughter comes out not because you like because it's not normal right so what is a dark humor when you see something really fucked up right your brain doesn't really want to accept it or process it in that way like this is not normal right and uh, your mind starts to like see that as a ridiculous event you just start to laugh out right that doesn't make you dark or fucked up right if somebody makes a holocaust joke or world war 2 joke and everybody laughs that's their brain going oh that's ridiculous like i can't imagine somebody saying that or doing that or any type of scenario like uh, processing that uh, scenario right that's what makes you laugh now when i say they're like what you talking about i can process it yeah you can process it if you think about it more than a second but your instant reaction is a laughter your first split second doesn't process things it just sees that as ridiculous so people like have like oh how dare you d laugh at dark jokes how dare you laugh at this and like that hashtag walk or whatever that's not how human nature work right we see if you if you tell a dark joke and somebody doesn't laugh that's the problem issue because that person fully accepted that like oh that's not that's not ridiculous at all right oh that's not i'm not going to laugh at it it's not ridiculous what you talking about it's normal that's fucked up like it wasn't just a roll of the dice that maybe an ied would be meant for me next time Because the only rational response would be, get me the hell out of here. Send me home. And some guys did. Some guys found ways to get sent back to the fob or get... Wait a minute, you can't do that? I'm pretty sure you can't. Once you enlist, like, you have no control, right? Like, mostly. You can't just say, I want to go home. It's, it's that defecting, isn't it? Like, if you're on duty, you have to be on duty type. I don't know much detail about that. But yeah, once you enlist, you basically have to follow orders, right? But taken off duty. That's the rational response to that. The irrational thing is to stay and make jokes about it, because if you don't do that, you're going to go insane, I feel like. But I'm sharing this with you, knowing that I'm opening myself up to like criticism and people make fun of me or they'll. Look, I don't want to pause too much, but I think what he did was the right thing. If he instantly just fucked off and like ran away, that would have scarred him for life. He would see that event as like too hard. He processed it laughed it with his people that he, his friends or whatever like you know fellow soldiers that he was with there in the first place if anything that made him sane enough because if he had just run away if he would have been scarred in some way even if he don't realize it it would be in subconscious level like that that's not healthy so if anything like processing it is better say like it wasn't that that bad the first thing that, that you couldn't handle that even and it's like yeah i I wasn't deployed to Fallujah. My tour wasn't crazy. It wasn't as bad as many. It was worse than some, but I did my part and I saw enough of war and its horrors to know the consequences and the price that is paid. I'm proud of my service, um, but I did handle it poorly in the moment and 
uh, I feel bad that a young Iraqi kid died. And I don't know if it was the same guy that I had been talking to and joking with the day before, but I never saw that guy again. And I, I pray that it wasn't him. I feel awful that he was just trying to provide for his family. And a lot of jobs and opportunities were taken away from Iraqis when we deployed, when we went there, because there wasn't a ton of opportunity. So they had, this was how he paid, you know, support. These are how these people supported their families and themselves. When I say war is worthless, I really mean it. A couple of years after I left Mushada, it was taken over by ISIS. There's still violence there to this day. Sometimes I struggle with feeling like I, we accomplished nothing, obviously. My personal experiences inform everything. Yeah, wars are never good. I don't care what your argument is. There has never been a single war that is good. You would argue like, okay, we fought World War II because it was like fight for freedom. The fight wouldn't exist if there was no Hitler, an aggressor like Nazis, right? I'm mean, sure there are bad elements and you have to defend yourself. But the whole reason you defend yourself is because there's a bad element in the first place. No wars are good, right? Ever. There's never a scenario where that's, that's, that's ever works, right? You would hope, at least hoped, that 21st century is going to be more like global economy and diplomacy. That didn't work either with the recent things. Hopefully that recent things dies down. It becomes a thing of like, okay, something become too aggressive. And maybe that's not going to be a norm. Because if it doesn't, like, was, like as soon as the Ukraine was start, basically with no, not much of a difference in a year or so, the Middle Eastern war started. It's like what are you waiting for some war to pop up so you can do something this is a problem i have with the world when somebody is first everybody just follows like they don't care after that which is more fucked up i don't know which other war is going to pop up but it feels like it might china taiwan thing might happen now because like other wars are already happening this is the fear i have right if somebody uses nukes right now other will use nukes because they, they won't be the first one right I, i'm glad the us have given ultimatum to Russia, like, n do not even think about touching nukes, because at then, then, like, it would be a problem type of way. Hopefully, there will be enough. I'm, I learned that recently, and I'm glad actually that happened, because you don't want to have nukes at all, right? Anything with nukes, we're fucked. On this channel, I talk about war for a living. I understand how awful war is. It's this cognitive dissonance, contradiction that I live with. And I struggle with sometimes. And that's why I wanted to share this story with you. Because sometimes I'll be joking and laughing about a weapon system or war, making a dark humor joke. And then the next second, I'm deadly serious. And people, I think, they think maybe I'm glorifying war or I'm minimizing it or I'm profiting off of it. And man, I just said, right, how humor works, right? I just, you know, give my take on it, right? So just because somebody makes a dark joke doesn't mean they're like, that's not how humor works. That's not how human psychology works. If somebody doesn't make jokes and make dark jokes and just consume everything, every dark thing, that's a problem. Like, what is your mind, man? I'm scared of you now, right? That's the problem thing. If you don't like, <laughs> just like try to break the ice and make a joke there, if you don't do that, like you're basically a scary person at that point. So if anything, making dark jokes is like, like coping mechanism in a way. That's not my intent. It's just my experience with war. This channel reflects my experience and understanding of war. War to me is one day you're joking with your spare parts squad, you're joking with your fourth squad and you're, you're, you're making light of things. And then the next day you're deadly serious. And that was my, that was my war. You know, spare parts squad is, we had a tab that we wore on our, all of our sleeves in fourth squad because we were made up of backfills, guys that didn't want to be there, guys that had been pulled out of retirement back in to fill, fill bodies, fill space. My goal with this content really is to get people more interested in geopolitics, to get people more interested in defense, because I think defense is absolutely necessary. Having a good defense prevents war in many cases. If if every side knows that war is in an ab many cases, all cases. Do you have any idea how much wars America would face in past 50 years if they didn't have this kind of like $800 billion budget in military and all this insane tech and nukes and God knows what? 
America is the top go- top top dog. You always gun for the top dog. There's many countries who will come after America very easily, very easily. It's definitely you know prevents and you have to have defense, right? Because like I said, no wars is good. Neither was World War Two. But imagine if like good guys didn't have weapons. We all would be we all would be like under Nazi occupation. That like Wolfenstein game scenario. So it's absolute nuclear weapons are bad it kills a lot of people but it ended a war right let's be honest most of japan would have killed itself by trying to defend itself nuclear weapon kind of stopped that so you know there's many sides to everything absolute catastrophe and should be avoided by all costs then there's less likelihood of war. So sometimes I talk about hypothetical situations of war between Russia and China and the United States. I talk about it because to show what a disaster it would be, not because I'm like, I want this to happen. F- no, I think the more lower. Why does he explaining that? Like, isn't that common sense? If you don't understand that already, like, what is your IQ again? Like who's going, who's watching Task and posting like, oh, this is a bad person. It's like glorifying this and then profiting from this, like profiting on news channel, profiting from like, uh, you know, when they cover war scenarios and things, when, when experts talk about and release their books about war, are they profiting? What does that even mean profiting? Task and purpose has been really instrumental, at least to me, because I don't trust a lot of news sources, right? Very few channels, like probably Real Life Floor, but then again, he posts not as regular as Task and Purpose. Task and Purpose has been like one of the main channels I've been watching past two, three years, where I'm like, okay, this is this is decent information, right? From like Middle Eastern war, Ukrainian war. So that's important. And you know, if, if I can get information like that, I know that a lot of people, like he has 1.7 million subscribers, half a million views on this and like multiple million views in other his videos. So he provides a good information on to everybody and he's like relatively quick, right? He doesn't take his time. It takes a month to get the information out. He, he creates a video relatively quick every like a day or two maybe. Something happens today, today, three days or so, he'll post a video, well scripted video, not just like vlog type shit. Listed soldiers and troops and people who are interested in joining, the more they're aware of the geopolitics and the context surrounding these conflicts, the more likely they are to avoid it. And that's what I want to do. I don't want to promote war. I want to promote the understanding of war. To this day, I still think about what happened and I handle it a lot better now. And I think that this channel, this is one of the ways that I, I try to turn things that were negative in my life into a positive. And I try to make my experiences at the military, try to focus on the good aspects of it. I hope that even if you disagree with me on a topic, you'll is still engage with it and comment and, and enjoy the video because I want people to be here who are supportive of Iran. I want people who are supportive of Russia and China to come here and talk. I don't want to just be talking to people like clapping like seals who just, you know, t- preaching to the choir, basically a bunch of people who are just pro American. What's the point of that? I want to engage with people on good faith. And I want, I want you, especially, especially if you disagree with me, I want you to listen to me and enjoy this content and I will always hear you out and I will change my, and if you've watched this channel for a long time, you'll know, I'll change my opinion based on what you guys say in the comments. If I see someone, you give me a good source and you tell me I'm wrong about something. I look that up. You've seen, I I don't keep the same positions throughout, throughout time. So I don't often just go off script and talk and like rant so i appreciate your patience if you're a veteran and you're struggling with ptsd there's a lot of resources you can reach out to there's help for you you could reach out to 988 lifeline i'll put another resource up on screen right now that you can call the va veteran crisis line as well if you want to know more about me you can follow me on instagram and twitter chris yeah look as far as like (laughs) The today's world, especially past six, seven years, has become so like it's either this or that. Middle ground is near impossible. You're not gonna have people from both sides like coming to you and like, okay, even though I disagree with this guy, I'm gonna stay here and take his video. No, if there are people who doesn't like your take, they'll be like, oh, what an idiot, and they will walk away, right? And there will be one point of view, right? Whether you like it or not, there is like near objective truth to things. 
right how you get that information is hard but once you get it once the picture becomes clear the, the, like, out of the gray area the, there must be once you know like objective truth like okay this is what the reality is there will be people who pick and choose and try to mold the reality the way they want to see because they are from that place they want to see that uh, reality to be true not that okay wait a minute the people who are aligned with are wrong and this is revelation maybe i should think about it. no 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 it's my team and my team always is right how to make that real okay let's pick and choose this information and focus on that there will always be people like that this is what concerns me a lot i'm an indian and i'll talk about this channel a lot of times like how many indian things are there that is a problem right i already talked about traffic in this video and like a lot of things like when i see a problem I'm as a patriot as in patriot is going to be when it comes to, comes to India. But I'm not a, some nationalist who's just going to say like India can do no wrong. That's the problem, right? But the people are becoming that a lot. Like my team is never wrong. How, how, how I mold that and how I consume that. People tell me in the comments all the time, if you didn't agree with this original video, why did you make a reaction of it? So what, I'm supposed to just watch things that, or react to things that I agree with? If I don't agree with it, I'm, like there was like a video about... Uh, uh, how religion and mathematics is a thing and whatever i don't i think it was from radium zoom or something and people in the comments like if you're not gonna agree with this why watch it because i have good understanding of that right and if i see something wrong i'm gonna critique it right i don't just nod my head and agree and that's a reaction that's not what i do i look at this video it's like 15 minutes and i've been yapping my mouth it's like 36 minutes because when i when i know something i can give some input on something based on the things i kind of know and really know Right, I'll tell you what field that I strongly understand and know about, and I'll just point blank say that. And some like this is what I think. I'll say it like that if I kind of know that. But I'm here to give my take on things, right? But the world has become like that. It's either this or that, and just like you will create this team which is kind of fucked up. Like where you gonna have conversation otherwise? But yeah. All right, well, that was how seeing someone kill an accent changed me. But it's an task and purpose. If you like my accent, don't forget to subscribe. And yeah, I'll see you next time.